four has to grip us with is that God doesn't want Christians to settle for less than an overflowing life. Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Have you been baptized and immersed in the Holy Spirit? The proof of it, John 7, 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The water that Jesus gave them. He said, once you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. And the proof of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit over and over again, is that rivers will flow out of us. None of us have that life as of yet. I don't believe any of us have that life. But that's why we must remain hungry for Him, for the Holy Spirit, constantly evaluating ourselves, not did I do this or did I not do this. Our rivers flowing, our rivers of the love of Christ flowing effortlessly, not like a rag that is squeezed and something falls out. But rivers. That's why we want to remain hungry people. Out of that hunger, family of God, out of that hunger, God speaks to us with his divine word and gives us words of life. God doesn't want water coming out of us. God doesn't want living water coming out of us. And only he can do that. And it is out of those words of life that we share with other people. We're not interested in doctrine. We're not interested in theology. We leave that to those who have been given the gift to teach. But what we want to hear is words of the life that God has given you from His Word. That's what we want to hear. That's what we call prophecy as, a, as the Bible refers to in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. It's to exhort, to encourage, and to console. So can I just have a raise of hands with those who have something that they'd like to share? What the Lord has done. Wouldn't you? Roger, Wenhai, Kishore, Bobby, Thomas, come on, <coughs> Jeremy. So we'll start, um, I'm going to repeat it. So start with Roger, no, so we'll start with Jeremy. Well, then we'll go with Roger, then Wenhai, then Kishore, then Thomas, then Kamal, then Solomon, then Renchu, and Bobby. Renchu will be right before Bobby. So folks, we've got a lot of people sharing. Let us use the time profitably. It's difficult for everyone to hear so many different people, but let us be brief. We want to have listen to words of life, and I'm absolutely confident the Lord will speak to every one of you. Good morning, family. Good morning, John. Good to see everyone. <coughs> I'm excited for the baby shower. I'm sure it's the service. Uh, I wanted to share from a verse in Proverbs, from our study of Proverbs. It's in Proverbs 17, uh, verse 9. It says, He who conceals a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. And um, I thought this, this verse really struck me because it seems backwards. Con um, concealing a transgression seems backwards. Um, but I, I was actually reminded when I read this that it's come up several times in Proverbs. So I want to show a couple of other examples that concealing isn't backwards for my own sake. But in Proverbs eleven thirteen, it says, He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy conceals a matter. And then in Proverbs 12, 16, it says, a fool, uh, Sorry. A fool's anger is known at once, but a prudent man conceals dishonor. And then uh, Proverbs 12, 23, it says again, A prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaims folly. To me, it's you proclaim folly or conceal knowledge of folly. So similar kind of a point. <clears throat> but it struck me in a very practical way at first, because in the working world, uh, those of us who are in the workplace, you got to know that the smartest person in the room is usually the person who can find why something's wrong and can point out an error or point out, you know, it's find a logical flaw or that sort of thing. 
And I find that it's a very natural thing to point out mistakes in others. Point out mistakes when you're working, even jokingly, you know, oh, you misspelled that word or something like that. Um, but it's a way to subtly build myself up. I make myself look good if I can find a flaw in others. And um, I was convicted this week not to point out mistakes because he who conceals a transgression seeks love. And if I'm going to love my coworkers, then I need to be not not like all the rest of the coworkers who are really quick to point out a mistake, but, but actually conceal mistakes and to overlook them. Um, but as I consider it further, I think there's also really great application in the church setting as well. Um, as we work together and we grow closer to each other, I think it's natural that we start to see each other's weaknesses. And I think that in some ways the Lord allows us to see each other's weaknesses to test us to see whether we're going to write each other off or whether we're going to keep laboring together. And I was reminded of the story of uh, Noah in Genesis 9. If you want to turn there. Genesis 9, and verse t- verses 20 through 27. <clears throat> it says, Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk, and uncovered himself inside his tent. And the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. But he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth. And let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And I'm not saying to hide sin, that's, that's not my point. But what I'm saying is um, to examine our heart's attitude when we, sin, when we see sin in someone else. Um, I think that as we live in close proximity together, we grow in fellowship and in unity, we'll inevitably get closer to each other and see certain unsavory things or each other's nakedness, so to speak. And um, my point is that how we deal with what we see in others is very telling as to whether, as Proverbs 17 says, 17 9 says, there's love in our hearts or division in our hearts. Do we have a heart of love or do we have a heart of division? And how I react to seeing the weakness of someone else will tell me that. And so it made me think, do I jump at the chance to expose? Do I jump at the chance to expose when someone is in error? Do I get fixated upon it? You know, you see, we can see little things like, you, you know, this person always says that or, or thinks about that or, or makes this point, you know. Do I get fixated upon it and then I see it every time we interact and every chance it has the opportunity to manifest? Or do I choose to look away, not judging as uh, Shem and Japheth did? And in some small way, I get to cover the nakedness of my brother. In Romans 15, it says, Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us. And it made me think that we're all fallen. We're, we're all uh, broken. And it's clear that this is instruction in Romans isn't meant to mean accept only those of you who are perfect. We're to accept each other despite our imperfections. And that gets more difficult the closer that we get. The more that we're able to spend time together, the more imperfections we naturally see. And do we seek to expose or to cover up each other's nakedness? And um, as I was thinking about this, what, to, what should I do instead if I don't... Or, given that I want to cover and not expose, what should I do instead? And um, it came to me that whenever I see some area of nakedness in my brother, I ought to redirect the natural tendency to judge and turn and judge myself. And it made me think that surely there's a reason that God has allowed me to see something, and that should begin with me. The first question I ought to ask should be, what is God showing me about me in this moment? What is God showing me about me? And it reminded me, I've been studying the life of David a little bit, it reminded me of a story that we're all pretty familiar with in the 1 Samuel 24, where Saul is hunting David and he's seeking his life, and he goes, uh, and David and his men are hiding in a cave. And um, it says in 1 Samuel 24, verse 3, Saul went into to the cave to relieve himself. He was literally naked. Um, but he went into the cave to relieve himself, and the men of David said to him, verse 4, Behold, this is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I am about to give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as seems good to you. And David arose and cut off the edge of Saul's robe secretly. So I see that David did not strike Saul down. He didn't actually kill him, and 
um, and he spared his life, but he wanted to have a little fun. He saw his brother's nakedness in a sense, and he just, he didn't kill him, which is the right decision, but he cut the edge of his garment off. And it says in verse 5, and this really struck me, I'd never seen it before. It came about afterward that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. And it just made me think about the sensitivity that I should have in my own heart towards seeing my seeing a brother's nakedness, and that I should be pricked. If, I, if I'm concealing someone's nakedness, it ought to convict me that there's division in my heart rather than love in my heart. Real quick, I wanted to share um, just a couple verses in Luke 5, 30 and 31. It's very clear. Um, and it, it, this is very, this verse 31, especially, has been grabbing hold of me. Answered, said to them, Those that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And I was talking to the Lord this week because He's been showing me some things where I've been like holding on to stuff for a long time, and He's like breaking breaking things loose. And um, I was like literally sitting there going, Lord, how could you have anything to do with me? You know, considering how bad I've been. And, and he, he directed me to this verse, and, and then I looked, so I saw that first, and then I looked up at verse 30. It says, the scribes and the Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink the publicans and sinners? And I just recognized that same murmuring in myself about myself. It's like, Lord, why would you eat and drink with a sinner like me? And so at the same time I'm realizing my sinfulness, I'm realizing my worst sinfulness of being a Pharisee about myself, even. Like, why would Jesus even have anything to do with me? But he's like, no, I've come to call sinners like you to repentance. And uh, I haven't come to call the righteous. If, you know, if you were righteous, that's what I wouldn't have anything to do with you. <laughs> so um, it was just a challenge to me, like, to, A, not to go there, about judging myself in that way of like, well, why would Jesus want to have anything to do with me? But And then accept the grace, A, accept the conviction as he's showing me my sin, and B, accept the grace of he came to call me to repentance. So, thank you. <coughs> Hello, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'd like to share something that I've been learning about recently. This is from, uh, one way to summarize it is from Proverbs in chapter 16, verse 2. I'll just read it real quick. It says, All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, uh, but the Lord weighs the motives. So, the way I interpret this verse for myself is that it's, whenever you do something, um, it could look absolutely good on the outside, but what the Lord cares about is not so much how many good things or activities that we do, but what is the, the state of our heart when we do something. That's what he really values the most. We could do a hundred things and have the wrong heart about it. It's not going to mean much. Um, but if we do it with the right heart, then it's going to matter. And I say this um, in the context of, I realized that when, I was, when we do a good thing uh, for the Lord, it's easy to start off good. But I think as time goes on, it's easy to develop in my life, I've noticed that a bit of a, a murmuring and complaining spirit and to do things with not the same type of joy uh, that I might have had. So, for example, let's say we, a good thing for the Lord, uh, I don't know, let's say we move this podium. So this podium actually belongs there at the end of every week, and then on Sundays we move it here. So let's say that's the good work that I do, so to speak. Um, the first time I do it, it's it's not too bad, right? It's, oh, we're coming to church, this is a new place, let's move the podium here. Great. Tell me to do that the tenth time. Tell me to do that the hundredth time or the thousandth time. Then it's hard to have that same, oh, okay, God, you want me to do this? Sure, I'll, I'll move the podium, no problem. Um, it's hard to have that same joy and, and a lack of murmuring or complaining. So what I've been challenged with this past week is to go back to, what, even if it's a thousandth time done doing something for the Lord, whatever it is, to, to be like the first time, um, to be that 
to have that joy and to not have any more mere complaining, whatever it is that we do for God. Um, so that's something I've been learning this, this past week. So thanks. Good morning, family. Good morning. Uh, just wanted to share about uh, the email that we have received this Thursday, November 6th. Um, this is uh, regarding dying to ourselves. In that email that we see in how James Calvert, you know, when he had a, got a question, you know, um, that the captain, uh, he asked him, you know, when he was about to go to the mission, he asked the questions, uh, you will die if you go among such salvages. Then the Calvert replied, we died before we came here. I really thank God uh, that God grabbed hold of me as we heard today in the morning that dying to the self. As we know, as I became a Christian, I've taken baptism is like dying to myself when I get into the waters and come out with his resurrection power. As we see the songs everywhere, we see the cross and so much we have heard from Brother Zach, uh, such a great encouragement like the cross itself is our will, you know, it is crossing the God's will, that is the cross. And uh, the reason, um, even uh, whenever I come across this dying to myself, it's kind of stops me there. I mean, uh, God wants to talk or reveal, you know, there's so much to learn or so much to improve for me in my own life in this area. Like there are some illustrations given by Brother Zach, like if you were to uh, appear before an exam, what would you prepare the most? If I were to say a kind of illustration like, okay, dying to myself, that would, I mean, for a Christian, uh, what is it that is stopping from being uh, living in a way, uh, you know, that is pleasing to the God? So for, it might be many reasons. Uh, why we might not get to a level where God wants us to live like a Christian way. One of the most important reasons I feel uh, from we heard is that we do not die. I do not die to myself in many areas of the life. Right from the very first decision that Adam and Eve has to make uh, to take a decision is to basically not their own will, but you know, uh, what the will or the decision that pleases God is thereby to develop character and uh, even in the Romans as we say that you know to transform to his image so then I realized that okay everything is going towards that goal that the God wants us that we, he wants us every time I deny my will die to myself build the character and then transform to his image Okay, fine, this is all like theory. I mean, I know, most of us, we know. But how do I reach to that point where Calvert said, yes, I died before I came here. Yes, even I want to be like that. When the time comes, when the decision comes, you know, I want to be dead to the self, to the sin, to the flesh, and to the world, so that uh, I can get ready for the final exam and be prepared for the one, which I know this is the definite question that comes in. If I can score in this like 60, 70 marks, I'm through. So one of the things um, that struck me uh, from Brother Zach's teaching from you know, whatever um, you know uh, I heard so far is that how do I do that? How do I die to myself? So the greatest gift uh, the God gives is the conscience that's within us. So every time you sin, uh, there's a conscience inside of us that troubles us uh, and if we are sensitive to that spirit of God be obedient and be humble and try to correct ourselves so God it is I feel that it is not like overnight like you know I died completely to myself to the world and the sin but it's like a slow and gradual process wherein uh, every time uh, there is something I transgress against the Lord spirit or I, I'm not obedience in small areas or big areas. So slowly as I yield myself to that spirit and uh, as I'm submissive and be humble and not to hide myself, my sins, 
then uh, then slowly we develop that habit and come to a point wherein i can totally be you know dead to the sin and to the flesh so that itself is you know uh, the baptism or you know we are dead to the self then i was i came across an article that uh, states like how we can really come to that point like you know dead to the self and uh, so here it says as his disciples like all of us uh, um we must identify with christ death and resurrection we must say no to our former elegance to sin through our faith and yes to the elegance of the christ we now have a focus on life because of his new elegance we are not to sin but to live for the god and in as in said in romans 6 from 10 to 12 but the life that he lives he lives to god so even now we consider ourselves to be dead to sin but alive to god in christ jesus so the point is that unless we are absolutely convinced the flesh is a destroyer we'll continue to listen and i continue to follow it we will in essence continue to serve it so we should be absolutely convinced that this flesh or you no know, whatever this is carrying this is against uh, as the same as the cross my flesh or you know my thoughts it's completely you know going against the spirit of the god and uh, you'll see from even from the words of jesus christ when he was on the earth uh, um can luke 9:23 it says if anyone would come after me let him deny himself and take the cross and also in john 12 24 truly truly i say to you unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies it remains alone but if it dies it bears much fruit so i'm really thankful to the god whenever i come across this uh, thought or you know <coughs> this particular theme in the christian life it really grips me so much i am so hungry and thirsty that not the theory part not that you know i might understand in my mind but tomorrow when the situation comes in or to come to a trial or somebody comes to me and ask me okay do you want to do this you know uh, somebody were to ask me this question i have to be prepared in my heart and my soul and spirit yes because i am already prepared to die not that you know not this theory or whatever i'm sharing but i'm really thankful to god that god has gripped me in my heart when it comes to like you know as jesus in his own words he says you know unless you die you know we cannot see the resurrection power of christ working in our life and this article has uh, really good points uh, that says you know how we can go about and you know uh, get to that stage and uh, um the commitment to saying no to the old nature comes only as much as we are sure of the old natures the total rebellion against the god and we have the desire to serve the spirit but the old nature that always comes back to us uh, uh, that is going against the will of the god so yeah um, this is what something has been uh, blessed me a great uh, you know this week and have been time and again going back and thinking about how i can better improve and i seek uh, the help of the church and you know really look forward and the help from the god that i i can grow more and more in this area that i can deny myself will more and more and be transformed into his likeness and character good morning family i am really blessed by the words i heard from this pulpit um in the beginning brother sandeep asked as a question what you are going to grab hold of this is my answer i am trying to grab hold of the nature of jesus christ to be conformed to the nature of jesus christ which will lead to eternal life that we read in 1st timothy 6 19 6 
uh, 1 Timothy 6.19, Apostle Paul asked Timothy to grab hold of or get, get hold of the life that is truly life, that is eternal life. So that is my prayer too. The, I know that will not happen um, overnight. It will be a gradual process and uh, it will be complete at the time of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I am praying that, that my desire be accomplished in my life. I was um, uh, going through Gospel of John chapter 6 verse 37. Gospel of John chapter 6 verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never <coughs> drive away. So this is a great comfort and courage for me that uh, whoever comes to our Lord Jesus Christ he will not push away or drive away for to the enemy to destruction so I am trying to be with the Lord Jesus Christ I am trying to be, um, stay close to him a um, good husband or a good bridegroom will not push away his um, bride or wife uh, never will um, he will do that in the same way the, the, the husband and wife or the bridegroom and the bride will always like to stay together. To, um, they always like the closeness to each other. In the same way, I like to be um, with the Lord Jesus Christ. I like to have the closeness uh, to my bridegroom who is Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to have a bride and relationship with my Lord Jesus Christ, with my bridegroom Jesus Christ. So I want to have a bridal relationship, a cherishing life. Um, I know that my Lord Jesus Christ wants to have um, a cherishing life with me. And also in the same way, I also like to have, an, or I want to have a cherishing, a relishing life with my bridegroom in Jesus Christ. May the Lord help me and all of us. Thank God. Good morning, everyone. I <coughs> um, was uh, listening to Brother Zach, God, Brother Zach, and uh, came through a scripture that, that was on my mind this week and blessed me. It is John chapter 5, verse 35. Um, Jesus gave testimony about many people when he was here on earth, and we are looking forward for a testimony from him, a uh, good and faithful servant, right? And here Jesus gives about um, John the Baptist, and he calls him that he's a light that is burning and that is shining. And I was, I was thinking that, God, I want to be that light. I want to be burning for you. I want to be shining for you. What, um, so a few thoughts came to my mind. And interestingly enough, if you see you know, Exodus chapter 2, you see another light that was a bush that was burning. And, um, and interestingly enough, that bush was in wilderness, and this bush was in wilderness too. Um, and if you read that Exodus chapter 2, you see um, that the fire was coming from the middle of the bush. The word used in uh, NASB is midst. And, um, and in other versions, you'll see middle. And in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we see that man is a body, soul, and spirit. So fire must be coming from way deep within us. Uh, so I was seeing that when Jesus looked at John the Baptist, he saw a fire that was not coming from outside John the Baptist. It was coming from his deepest part in his own life. It was coming from his very spirit. It was, it was his own conviction. And this fire wasn't ending. You know, if you, if you see physics law, E is equal to MC square, you know, as long as the mass is there, the energy, but here this energy is not going away. It's, it's keep increasing. That reminded me of the scriptures that Jesus said about abundant life the, and scriptures that he said about 
um, you know, John 10, 10. And, uh, you know, Psalm 23, 5, we see that the cup is overflowing. And you see uh, scriptures in the New Testament, God talks about the rivers of life that is way deep within us that never quenches. And this this only showed me that this is John the Baptist's life was a life was was overflowing. It was not a life that was empty. And uh, the constant shining was the proof that he was being filled from within by the Holy Spirit. And um, and in the same thing happened, right? If you see Exodus chapter 2, we see that it says the bush was burning, but it was not getting burned up. And I, I, I understood from this that, I, Lord, I want my life to be a burning life for you from way deep within and let it shine. But I was thinking, Lord, what does, what does it take for the light to come out? And that reminded me of a scripture in Judges. Judges chapter... Um, Uh, just chapter 7 I think I, I, I forgot about the scripture but you know remember that scripture where Gideon God calls him and you know he, he tells him a few things to do he asks him to do one thing he asks him to take a horn and he asks him to take a picture now in the picture there is a light but the light is in the picture so you won't see the light but you will see the light only when the picture is broken and that reminded me that if we are broken life then only the light will shine. The light will not come automatically shining forth us. The prerequisite is we being broken. So that reminded me that uh, our Lord, he, He's shown His light and still shines His light on us. And uh, the, the, the most broken person that ever was, Philippians chapter 2, was Christ Himself. And that line, light uh, shone from Him. So that taught me that, Lord, I want to be a burning and shining light for You. I have to be broken at your feet. I have to be constantly filled by your very spirit of God so that I am burned. I am being. I will be burned and I won't get burned up. That I will shine that light uh, for your glory and honor and we press forward uh, for the glory of God. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, praise the Lord, uh, everyone. So I have read um, Psalms uh, uh, many times. So this time, uh, special for me, uh, God encouraged me through one, one verse in uh, Psalms uh, chapter 12 and fifth verse. Uh, let me read it for you. Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. So because of the devastation of the afflicted. In some other verse it says uh, the oppression of the weak. And um, especially from this verse God uh, encouraged me. If I am in constant need for him. And to overcome sin and the deeds of the flesh. There are many deeds of the flesh that uh, troubles us. And also to face the day-to-day uh, uh, -day troubles of life and worries of life. Um, for, especially for me, sometimes they are very oppressive. It could be a, a situation at the job or um, some family situation. So they are very oppressive. Um, in, in that situation, God is encouraging me. Um, in the verse it says, later verse, in the, says, um, the Lord says, I will set him in the safety for which he longs. As long as, uh, if I long for him to, uh, to get mercy and, and help from him, God says he will set me up in the safety for which he longs. That means uh, my longing is, is the Lord and uh, I want to trust him in his word. In the later verse it says, um, the words of the Lord are pure, pure words. As silver tried in, in a furnace on the earth, uh, refined seven times. I want to trust him uh, in his word uh, to get the safety and uh, whatever the desire that I have in the Lord. And, uh, uh, and also in some other verse it says in the Psalms, the Lord is a shield to those who take refuge in him. So I want to take, take refuge in him, show that he would be my shield. Amen.
praise God. I thank God for the words uh, we've been hearing. Uh, I think I've shared, I know I've shared a couple of times from here how uh, anxiety has been an issue for, for me after after moving here, or even before then. And I kind of thought that I'd got it under control or, you know, God had given me victory, victory over it. Um, and then this academic year started again. Um, and so, and as things went on, I, I saw different parts of it coming at it and, and it, it was, I, it feels like an onion, like I've, I've peeled off layers and I'm still finding layers under it. Uh, and as after like a, a really bad week where I fell many times, um, I looked back into it and then but asked God, like, what are, you, what are you trying to show me from this? Like I'm, I'm falling on the same thing over and over again. Uh, and for me, what stood out was that I hadn't surrendered my will in terms, in, in turn of, to the matter of the fact that I was in the lab I'm working, I want to, you know, impress the people around me. I need, I need to prove my, prove my worth in the lab. Um, and so I was seeing that that had become my thing. It, had, it, was, it wasn't something I was willing to give up and say, God, you're in control. You're going to help, you know, I'll rely on your strength. But it was, God, I'm going to be working 10 hours and those 10 hours is going to be me focusing on my work and that'll be it. Uh, and as, as I kept failing over and over again, multiple times, God showed me that this is something I needed to surrender to God uh, and, and honestly say, God, if you've put me here, you're going to help me and, and give me the strength that I need uh, to go through it. And over the past week, I was uh, reading a book which talked about Abraham and his, his sacrifice of, of, uh, of Isaac or his near sacrifice of Isaac. Um, and I feel that was the, the biggest, like, I mean, one of the biggest... Um, surrenders you see like you know uh, if, in, the, in the book it talks about how you know, uh, as we all know it like abraham waited a long time for isaac and regardless of all the wealth he had isaac was the main thing uh, that he held on to and when god asked him to give it up he gave he came so close to giving it up and god asked him to stop uh, but after that the book talks about abraham's uh, view of things after that and that's what stood out to me the most and i just like to read that out because i don't think i can uh, do a better job than that, of the, than the book, sorry. Um, so after that, the world would have said, Abraham is rich, but the aged patriarch would only smile. He could not explain it to them, but he knew that he owned nothing and that his real treasures were inward and eternal. Now, seeing is, is that true in my life? I'm able to look and say, you know, wherever, wherever I'm at, whatever I hold, you know, I the things on this earth aren't the most important thing to me. I, it's not something, I, you know, I'm... I'm holding on to the, the closed fist. It's not, it's not my real treasure, but my real treasure is inward and eternal. Uh, and I'm, I'm thanking God for the opportunities that I have to, to find out more and more uh, of you know, things I haven't surrendered and, and I still need to surrender into as well. I wanted to share from Luke chapter 11, verse 13. You've heard this verse a lot lately. <clears throat> I'll read it. Luke eleven thirteen. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? <clears throat> and I was blessed a few weeks back when Brother Winhai shared uh, um, this verse and uh the way he kind of saw it in his life was that he explained it. And he, the way he put it was that God's not a father who kind of dangles things in front of us. And as we try to reach for it, pulls it away further and further. And um, that uh, when you put it into those words, it kind of helped me to see this verse in a different way and God's uh, generosity and his mercy and his love in a different way. And um, kind of like how Paul had the scales fall off of his eyes. I felt like the scales fell off my eyes in a, in a little way about God's mercy and love that he's um, a generous giver. I think in a sense, I, um, I maybe have started to believe or have believed over time in a sense that God does kind of dangle things in front of us and um, uh, pull it away for uh from us for different reasons. And I just figured, well, he's just wanting to grow me spiritually. But I was always just kind of looking at the, the material worldly things that I pray for that, or things that I want for myself that aren't necessarily promised in his word. And I believe that maybe that was why I um, could start to see God in a little of the wrong light, because I wasn't looking at it from an eternal perspective, but from the world's perspective. And that uh, when I look at things from a worldly perspective, that can give me a wrong view of 
who God is. Um, and so I was meditating on this and uh, wanted to share a little bit about Judas, who um, I believe that his view of God was tainted. Uh, and the reason why is because I was thinking about it, and even though he did such a horrible thing to by betraying Christ and selling him for silver, I believe um, that if he would have repented from that, I believe that God would have forgiven him. Um, I, I don't know this for sure, but I, I mean, I, I think that, that as far as I know, uh, if Judas would have turned around afterwards, that God would have forgiven him and received him back um, with open arms. And um, I say that because I look at what Peter did. Peter denied Christ. And I don't know if what Peter did was that much worse than what Judas did, because um, Ju Jesus said something very um, fearful in, uh, um, math in uh, Matthew ten thirty three. I'll just read that <clears throat> about people who deny Christ, people who deny Him. Matthew ten thirty three. Uh, Jesus said, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. So I can imagine that Peter must have just um, had these words of Jesus ring in his mind after he denied Christ and figured he lost all hope. Uh, so I can't say for sure that what Ju Peter did was that much better than what Judas did or what Judas did was that much worse than what Peter did. And, I, and in a sense, I... Um, I think I see how Peter Peter was different than Judas in the sense that he saw God as merciful. He, he believed God was merciful and he saw his loving kindness, but Judas didn't. And I believe that was the difference. Um, Judas, when he was discouraged and he regretted it in a sense because um, he was broken and he went out and hung himself, but he figured he was had no hope left. And so he went out and basically ended his life. But Peter, he, he was discouraged for a while, little while, but then he came back and had hope again, and he, um, he was reconciled with God. He, didn't, uh, he, he wanted to quit being a, an apostle, but then he, he saw God calling him back, and he, he had hope again. And so I believe that the difference between Peter and Judas was that Judas um, didn't, see God's, didn't see God as loving. He didn't see God in the right light, even though they both sinned tremendously against Jesus, um, and that was uh, the difference. Jesus said about Judas in uh, Matthew twenty six twenty four that it would have been better for him if he had never uh, been born. So I, I believe that Judas died unsaved. And, um, and so the, le the lesson that spoke to me was, um, do I really believe that if I see God as unloving and unmerciful, that it's better that I would have just never been born? If, uh, if I have a wrong view of God and I miss who he is, is it better... It, do I really believe that it's better for a person to have never been born that doesn't know about God, God's love for them? <clears throat> and so um, just kind of relating that to um, what I heard Brother Winhai share is that I just want to see, have uh, more of a consciousness and grab a hold of that more, even if I don't feel like it all the time, that God has tremendous love for me. And uh, Romans, many of us are familiar with Romans chapter 6, verse 14. It says, for sin shall not be master over you, but for you are not under law, but under grace. In a way, I think you could paraphrase that is, uh, if, if you don't see God as gracious, then you're going to be living under law your whole, your whole life until you see God as gracious. But if I see God as gracious, then that's the way for sin not to be master over me. That's the way um, to not be living under the law of God as a, um, a judge um, who just wants to lay down the hammer on all of his the slaves and people give out what people are deserving, but um, being under grace means seeing that God is gracious. <clears throat>